Hi, and welcome back. My name is John Bloomfield. I'm a photographer from the northeast of England, and I make these little videos to talk about photography generally, um, occasionally the odd technical thing, and uh, the gear that I use. Um, if you find my videos useful, or interesting even, then it'd um, be great if you could subscribe, I'd appreciate that. Today I'm going to talk about Pentax, their uh, position in the market generally. Um, I'm going to say the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, this is going to be part one of three. Number two, video two, I'm going to talk about the uh, lens lineup and where it's going. And number three, the body lineup and where it's going. So, yeah, be back with you in a second and we'll talk about uh, Pentax, its current position in the market, the good, the bad and the ugly. Okay, so... Pentax, a very well established brand in cameras and uh, photography been around for a very long time and at one point during the film era of course it was probably the biggest camera brand, um, now a very small player in the market. So talk about where they're at and where they're trying to head possibly, um, I thought I'd give you my views on what, what's happening and what I think is good and bad and ugly about the uh, Pentax position in the market at the moment. The good thing I think is uh, Pentax know how to make cameras. Sounds like a silly thing to say, but they do. They, they make cameras that are comfortable and enjoyable to use. They've always prioritized the user experience and the design of their cameras. Um, I think nothing exemplifies this more than the very bright 100% coverage viewfinder using a pentaprism. Um, part of the name Pentax comes from pentaprism. Um, and that's on all of their bodies. Um, it doesn't matter whether it's an entry level or a top end body. They prioritize the user view. The buttons on the cameras are all just in the right places. Um, even when they make a move from model to model, it always seems in my experience to have been an improvement. Um, and there is one body I've avoided because it didn't feel comfortable in my hand, but that was the exception, I would say, rather than the rule. Even my first Pentax was the Pentax KS2, um, which is a very small body. I think at the time it was sold along with the collapsible 18 to 55, no, 18 to 50 um, RE lens. Um, it was marketed as the world's smallest DSLR, and even that felt really quite decent in my, in my hand. And uh, my hands are not small hands. So, from a business perspective, they do make good DSLRs and um, there's obviously a lot, there's often a lot of innovation in there, a lot of things that are in Pentax cameras before they're in any, in any other camera brand. Um, Pentax pioneered the uh, pixel shift technology that we see in lots of other brands now. Um, so that, that's where they're at as far as making the cameras are concerned. Um, where are they positioned at as a company and moving forward in what they're doing? Well, we get a lot of criticism online from existing Pentaxians and um, other people because they're not making a move into the uh, the mirrorless space. Um, they've made some comments which I'm not sure how well they've been translated um, from Japanese to English about how they think photographers will come back to DSLRs. Now I don't think that they imagine that the whole world's going to switch back from mirrorless. But I think um, the position they've taken to not go into the mirrorless world, whether you want to shoot mirrorless or not, I think is actually quite a good marketing position to take. It, I know it sounds counterintuitive when everybody else is jumping on the mirrorless bandwagon, but if you've watched my videos before, you've probably heard me say that I've been self-employed most of my life, and part of being self-employed is that you do have to take an interest in marketing. And if anybody out there has taken an interest in marketing over there, it's, you know that in the modern world, what an awful lot of business consultants will preach and marketing experts is that you need to find a niche, or if you're American, a niche, um, a place in the market where you can deliver a product that is specific, you're well known for, it's not very well covered by other people, and by do hitting that niche in the market, you have a small section of the overall market but that'll become a dedicated section you will be the go-to brand that can fill <coughs> that that niche in the market and i think the whole pentax is going to stick with the slr when everybody else is going mirrorless thing 
is exactly going to provide Pentax with that niche. And if you bear with me, I mean, we've got Nikon and Canon who have dominated the DSLR market for as long as as long as digital's been around, pretty much. Um, They've both jumped onto the mirrorless bandwagon now. Canon have basically said that they are finished making lenses for um, their DSLR range. Um, how long until they stop making DSLRs altogether? They've put a lot of effort in making a good converter for their lenses to get them onto the to get people onto the new mount. Um, Nikon have done, or Nikon have done the same thing. So they're going mirrorless. Sony's pioneered mirrorless. Fuji are always in, already in the mirrorless market. So who does that leave in the DSLR section? For, for, it's Pentax, isn't it? That's, that's going to be who's left at the end of the day. Um, so there will be some people who make the move to mirrorless, but there'll be lots of people who currently shoot DSLR, don't really want to go mirrorless. And they have to consider another mount anyway if they're gonna go mirrorless because there's no point transferring a DSLR mount to a mirrorless camera because you're not gonna be able to take advantage of a lot of the features of mirrorless by carrying over the mount, which is one reason why Pentax, I think, won't go down the mirrorless road because they haven't got the resources to suddenly remount all of their own lenses. They could go down the keeping the K mount, but again, you, you lose a lot of the um, advantages of mirrorless if you're going to get rid of the mount. But that's an aside, really. But you've got all these people who are looking to leave their DSLR brand because it's not long being supported, and they will either go to mirrorless and use the converters for their existing glass, or they'll start again and tell you with a new mount. Um, so there's Pentax still offering a DSLR option. A lot of people will go to mirrorless, and I'm sure some people won't like it and will want to come back to DSLR, and there's going to be Pentax offering their DSLR brand. Um, and hopefully becoming well known for the DSLR brand. So I think, whether they intended to or not, they've hit themselves, they've got themselves into a niche in the market. I think a certain part of it has happened because of resources, um, not being able to develop a mirrorless um, because of the resources that the Pentax division within Rico has. Um, realising that they can't produce lenses fast enough to make a genuine transition to another mount. And I think the idea that they're going to market themselves as a pure DSLR brand um, is why they didn't join the Element Alliance with um, Leica Sigma and Panasonic, because they don't want to, because they want to stick on this DSLR brand um, where they can continue to produce their own lenses and they can fall into a niche. And I think... This is something that they've consciously decided because a couple of years ago, um, there was an article from an interview with one of the Pentax executives, sorry, Ricoh executives, where they made comments that they were gonna bring all of their um, consumer imaging under the Pentax brand. So we expected that the Ricoh GR3 would be branded the Pentax GR3. And we thought that the latest data cameras would all come out with the Pentax badge on, but they didn't. And I think what Pentax have done, Rico generally really, have realized that actually they've got the brands there. And the brands are falling into a niche. And when you're in a niche, you can charge a premium for your product. They can't really do it at the moment for the DSLRs because they are still competing. But if they can hang in there long enough for everybody else to leave, to leave them at that section of the market, they become a niche player, and a niche player can prove a, charge a premium. I mean, a good example of that is the Ricoh GR3, which is a niche camera. Um, huge cult following, um, very popular with street photographers. Specifications-wise, it's, it's almost identical to the Fuji XF10, physical size, sensor size, um, lens, um, the image quality, the, sen the sensor size, the focal length of the lens, the maximum aperture of the lens, um, all incredibly similar. But the Fuji is half the price of the Ricoh GR3 because the Ricoh GR3 is seen as the Apple, the niche brand, the brand that has a tribe behind it. And that's something else that Pentax has got going for it in the, the good category. Um, when you read a lot about marketing, one of the things that is strongly encouraged for any brand is to build up a tribe. A tribe of all your customers, but a different type of customer. They're very loyal 
customers. They see the bad brand as a badge of honor. They believe in the company, they believe in what the company does. Um, they tend not to look too much at what everybody else is doing because they are so happy with the product that they've got and the brand that they're with. And um, sorry if the fridge just got very loud. Um, so they t Apple really is the pioneer of the brand. Um, people who like Apple like Apple and they'll buy pretty much everything Apple produce, um, true fanboys. And Pentax does have that. Um, I'm, I'm frequently surprised when talking to the Pentaxians um, how little they know about what's offered by other brands because they are so into the Pentax system and into the Pentax way of thinking and the Pentax way of doing things and Pentax has never let them down. And Pentax made this, not sure if it was deliberate, but ultimately clever move of keeping the same mount for I think it's best part of 40 years now, maybe even longer. I'm sure it's actually closer to 50 years now, um, which means you've got this huge back catalog of legacy glass uh, made it very easy for people to transition from film to Pentax Digital. Um, and it keeps people in the system. Um, even though the Pentax lens range isn't as big as some other brands, um, I'll talk about that in the video, um, there's so much old stuff available that um, people are in the system. And a lot of people enjoy that, being able to use those, that vintage glass. And, yeah, I think Pentax really does have a tribe. Um, you'll see other non-Pentaxians um, are a little bit afraid sometimes in, on YouTube of talking about Pentax in a <coughs> negative manner because the tribe is so defensive of the brand that they are very quick to um, correct errors in YouTube comments um, and often quite an aggressive and personally I find quite amusing way. But um, yeah, so Pentax definitely has a tribe. And the bad thing, the bad. Um, start off with Pentax's market position. The worry with not going too mirrorless is that you end up like the brand that didn't go to digital, um, that hung on a film for too long, um, and you can't produce enough units that people people don't want enough of your product in order to make it a sustainable business. Now, I really don't think that's going to happen. I actually think that there will always be a market for a DSLR over a mirrorless camera system. So I don't think they really have to worry about that. Um, what they have to worry about is keeping up with the technology that mirrorless is offering. So for example, I mainly shoot portraits in eye autofocus um, that you see on Pioneer by Sony, but now available on Canon, etc., um, is very attractive. Um, I know a lot of Pentaxians don't get it or understand what it is, but essentially it'll allow you to concentrate on your composition if you know that the focus point is just always going to track the eye. Simple as that. And it'll track the nearest eye. Um, it makes the use of sh very shallow depth of field a lot more feasible. And I know there's at least one person who may be watching this video who's thinking, well, Pentax already has eye autofocus in live mode. It doesn't. It has face tracking. Um, it's okay. It's not great. Um, but the autofocus for it is directly on the sensor. And one thing I will definitely say about the live view in um, Pentax cameras is the focus, uh, if you just use the spot or the area focus um, with a very shallow depth of field, it is definitely more accurate than when you use through the viewfinder. Absolutely, definitely. So it's interesting that a little while ago, Pentax patented a hybrid viewfinder. If they can find a way to allow you when circumstances require to pop the live view into your viewfinder, because I personally still like to have the camera at my face. If they can find a way to pop that into the viewfinder and let you use the on-sensor autofocus under certain circumstances, um, yeah, that would be mind-blowingly massive step forward for Pentax and DSLRs. I think other brands have looked at it and I think they've given up on it and gone down the mirrorless route anyway. But I think I'm uh, I'm wandering a little bit here. But yeah, that's a risk. So that's part of the bad. And that's a risk. The main bad for Pentax um, is I don't think they know how to market themselves in the modern world. They're a small, although they're owned by Rico, which is a massive company, um, they're a small part of Rico's enterprises and um, not necessarily a priority. 
but the market like they're a big company it's all one-way marketing um advertisements directed at people they don't engage in the way that modern brands do um you look at pretty much every camera brand for example has an ambassador program um ambassadors are essentially named photographers who are ambassadors for the brand so they'll do for most brands sony's a good example they have different tiers so they have their ambassadors who've basically been selected for the quality of their images um the quality of their work these are really sort of top shelf successful photographers and they will do talks talk about the brand they'll always be seen using the brand um they'll do talks they'll do stage shows and presentations and things like that about the brand and they'll try to get people interested in the system because of that then they have lower tier um lower tier is probably a bit patronizing but essentially photographers who are not necessarily the greatest most successful commercial photographers in the world but they are good at engagement so you'll get a lot of youtube photographers for example who um become brand ambassadors they will engage with the public through medium like this about the the cameras about the systems they'll do reviews they'll talk about why they like the system they'll make their educational videos etc and they'll use the cameras that be seen to be used and that really does help i think with um people feeling like they understand the brand like there's resources out there like it's of interest to them um pentax only really have the top level photographers the almost all on a global basis landscape photographers which is where pentax has historically targeted their cameras um there isn't a bad one amongst them they all produce absolutely stellar images and i'm sure they all do the odd talk and things for pentax but nowhere near on the scale that other companies do if you look at canon for example their ambassador program canon have clearly made fuji's the same have clearly made a decision to get some commercial photographers portrait photographers street photographers landscape photographers wedding photographers i don't know what the costs associated with um brand sponsorship and things like that are but i think pentax could look at modernizing their marketing in order to engage with their audience because the audience is there and it does want to engage um the community groups for pentax are incredibly busy and incredibly friendly um and incredibly helpful um on facebook you have the pentaxians group um you have the pentax cameras group of which i'm an admin which is uh they're two of the biggest groups um but there's lots of subgroups like uh, pentax um street photographers pentax wedding photographers there's lots of groups out there we still have pentax forums website we have pentax user website there's even still an old pentax mailing list um you know where you send an email to a central address and it distributes it to everybody um i'm on that i don't i don't use it very often but i do read what comes through on there um so there is definitely this still this market there uh, this this huge tribe of people who are devoted to the brand um and are ready to be engaged with um and if you engage with them enough they'll make enough noise on social media that it attracts the attention of other people and that's how these brands grow in the modern era really um pentax doesn't seem to be engaging in that way it still just seems to be constantly output um output 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 um not much avenue for things to come back um there is a dutch um ambassador um niels kemp um i think that's how you pronounce it i'm very sorry if it's not um who has a youtube channel uh, who shoots a bit of street um is very good and i think it's a positive move to have him because it's a much more modern um sort of approach to doing things um yeah it's a, i think he he engages quite well um i believe he's a part-time photographer and maybe doesn't produce as much content as maybe a full-time one but that's probably the same for their brands as well which is why they have a lot more bodies on the ground um doing these sort of things um the the other bad for pentax really I cover in the other end it's but in more depth in the other videos but the body lineup it takes pentax quite a long time to develop something and get it out there to the market so pentax i think made him possibly made a mistake going to full frame um so they they have an APS-C line full frame line 
and a medium format line. And I think really that's too much for them to handle as far as development and production is concerned. Um, Fuji, for example, had an APS-C line for a long time and now they've gone medium format and they've missed full frame out. Um, they basically say that they don't think there's a big enough gap be difference between APS-C and medium for and full frame to justify being there and not a big enough gap between full frame and medium format. So they might as well be at the two ends and miss the middle one out. And I can totally see the logic of that as um, sensor technology has developed. Um, I think it's been a clever move for them, and I'm not sure if one of Pentax's problems is that they are trying to cover too many bases. The medium format line, yeah, the 645 cameras, that's got to be crying out for a new body. But I'm not sure if Pentax has just let it die, um, because you never hear anything about it at all. And yeah, we all know Pentax don't really say anything about anything um, much uh, traditionally, although the new full frame 85mm lens must have been announced about 20 times in the last three years and we're just getting it to market now. Um, it feels like it was definitely, I think, in at least 2018 that it was first mentioned that they were developing a 50 and an 85. Anyway, that's beside the point. Um, so yeah, there's one of the problems is they sort of release bodies still on the old film cycle where a body could last five to 10 years. Um, where digital, people expect to see replacements every two to three years, I think. Um, on a conservative level, and Pentax aren't doing that. And what that does is, that even if they're only minor increases or minor amendments, um, by doing that, it lets the people know that the brand is still alive, that they're still doing things. And by not doing that, it creates a little bit of doubt in people who are about to, who are thinking about moving over. If you're about to move over and you want to go APS-C, and you're looking for the flagship, and you realise that it was released in that the flagship body is currently discontinued and was last released in sort of 2016, 2017, the K32 I'm talking about here. Um, that's not going to inspire confidence. I mean, there's been a couple of entry, uh, the K70 has been out since then, and the KP, um, but neither of them you would call um, professional bodies, uh, in my opinion, um, just because they don't have dual card slots. And I think that's become a prerequisite for a professional body. Doesn't mean they can't get professional quality images because they definitely can. I'm not saying that at all. There's nothing wrong with the image quality on those bodies. But professionals have checklists of what they want and an awful lot of those people will want dual card slots. There's no doubt about that. Um, I won't get into the debate about whether they really need them or not, but they look for them. They're available on other brands, so they want them. As simple as that, really. And that's the pro one of the problems. The brand looks a bit dead from the outside. Um, Another problem that you have is the let bodies that are in the market are a bit random. Um, if you're coming across and you're, uh, let's look at the full frames, full frame, right? We've got the K1, we've got the K1 2, pretty much the same camera with a few tweaks. The wrong tweaks, in my opinion. Um, might be the best landscape camera ever developed, but it has a couple of issues. It has a slow buffer, a shot, sorry, a shallow buffer and it doesn't write very quickly. So, for a landscape photographer, it doesn't matter in the slightest. For a portrait photographer, like myself, occasionally I do run into the buffer. Um, I shoot a lot of sort of very fast sessions with kids, and yeah, occasionally I do run into the buffer. For an event photographer, I imagine they're running into it all the time. And I don't accept the old, oh, if you weren't praying and spraying and all that. People aren't praying and spraying. They just, and anybody who says that and they're really shot an event, you do have to take quite a lot of shots at an event and often quite frequently you try to picture, create a picture of the day, um, particularly weddings for example, and um, you will take a lot of shots and they'll be quite close together. Again, the same with the stage performance. Um, you have to shoot quite a lot because you need to catch a shot of everybody, you need to get a, the whole cast, etc., etc. And you run at the buffer a lot but Pentax have only got that one full frame body. Now, somebody who's coming across from another brand, um, they need to see that there is more there than that. They might not just want that need. So at the moment, I feel like they're only catering to landscape photographers. And there are a few simple things they could do, which I'll talk about in the video about camera bodies um, in order to sort that out. Um, really simple things they could do, so simple that I just don't understand why they haven't done them. But there we go. Um, I'll talk about that in the other video. And then we have the ugly. 
know the ugly about Pentax. It's hard to sort of say as a dedicated Pentaxian who really doesn't want to bash the brand. Um, but the ugly is, they don't always do the right thing by the consumer, in my opinion. There's two issues here that spring to mind. The first one is something that we that's referred to in the communities as aperture block. Um, since the K30, K50, there's been this known fault where a solenoid fails. I believe it's a solenoid. I'm not a technical guy. Um, fails, which means that the mirror doesn't lift when you're taking shots, um, unless it's warm. And so you have to often have to fire it to warm it up to get it moving. Um, and it reduces them blank shots. It's been on the K30, the K50, um, I believe the KS1, the KS2 have had, had issues with it as well, not quite to the same extreme. Um, I believe the K70 is starting to have reports of a similar issue. Haven't heard of any on it, the KP as of yet. Um, the flagships like the K7, the K5, the K3s, they didn't have the issue. Now, what I say, but they don't do the right thing by the consumer is, when the camera's out of warranty, it's just tough. They know the problem is there. It's been going on for years on the, on the entry level and consumer, prosumer sort of bodies. Um, but they haven't fixed it. And I just don't think that's doing the right thing by the photographer. It's a bit, it's not very honorable. Um, from my personal perspective, I think they should have taken a policy on this where they should have said, if the camera's rated for, I don't know, 150,000 shots. If it gets aperture blocked before it hits 150,000 shots, we'll fix it, no matter what. I don't know why um, camera producers don't copy car manufacturers with their warranties and say, you know, five years or 150,000 actuations, whichever comes first, why we have to have this timeline um, based warranty when people use their cameras vastly differently. Some people will be out shooting events every weekend and clocking three or 4,000 um, accurations up. Other people will just shoot 20 shots of their kid once a month. Um, so that's a bit of a by the side, but it, to me, they have not done the honorable thing um, by the consumer when it comes to the aperture block. And that does bother me. And the other thing is similar. Um, one of the silent motor that Pentax developed um, in-house, I believe, um, when they stopped using screwdrivers, their primary nature is called SDM. It failed a lot. It failed on the 16 to 50 DA star. It fails on the 50 to 135 DA star. It fails on the 60 to 250 DA. Um, and they know this. They're well aware of it. Everybody knows it. People actually avoid buying SDM lenses because of it. Fix it. Pull it right, offer it, sort it properly, offer it, offer free repairs for anybody who's got a problem with one, based on serial numbers if you need to. Um, but people are just left on their own to sort these things out and try and deal with it. And again, it doesn't inspire confidence in the brand. I have actively avoided buying SDM, len SDM lenses. They're, they've got another silent motor called DC, which is on the 70 to 200. Happy to buy the 70 to 200 because it had the DC motor on it. Um, and they have it on, and they have the PLM, which is on the latest 55 to 300. Um, now I know a lot of Pentaxians will say, oh, well if on the earlier ones, like the 50 to 135, if the SDM fails, you convert it back to screw drive. Why should you? You're paying a premium for a silent lens. So why should you pay, then have to convert it to screw drive and have a noisy lens instead? Even if it's faster in screw drive mode, and it will be because it's like the slowest focus lens ever. The only SDM lens I bought was a 24 to 70 because I knew it was a rebranded um, Tamron. And I had more confidence that the SDM would be fine because it was Tamron's version. Um, I've been reluctant to buy the 50, even though 50s aren't my thing anyway. Um, the new 51.4, because of the fact it's Pentax's own SDM. Now they say that it's been upgraded, but and that it's better now and that doesn't happen anymore. Um, but I'll wait for the proof of the pudding really because they don't have a history, in my view, of doing the right thing by the consumer um, and sorting this out. 
Now, if you've had a problem with it and you think they've been exemplary, I'd really like to hear that in the comments section um, about what your experience has been in getting these things sorted when they've gone wrong. Um, because for me, it shakes confidence in buying that and putting down a thousand pound on a lens that I don't really need, but you know, might be quite nice to have. Um, and if it goes wrong, they're not going to sort it out for me. So that, for me, is the ugly. Um, if you think I'm total rubbish, feel free to tell me in the comment section below. Um, if you find these videos remotely interesting, then I'd greatly appreciate it if you were to subscribe. Um, it really helps me out and encourages me to make more videos. Um, so this was part one of three. Um, next video will be the lenses that Pentax offer and the lens roadmap and where they're at and where they're going and what I think they should be doing. So see you in the next video. Adios.